On this episode of True Crime Case Documentaries, we unravel the chilling case of a girl willing to kill her entire family, all in the name of love. It started out like any other southern teenage romance. The pastor's daughter found a bad boy that she just couldn't resist. He was a couple of years older and didn't quite put her dad's mind at ease, but his little girl was happy. At 16 years old, it was expected for Linda Carter to have a rebellious phase. It seemed like a relatively normal evening in Alba, Texas, but Tommy Gaston was in for the surprise of his life when his neighbor, Travis Carter, crawled to his house barely clinging to life. The scene was horrific. In the distance, his house was engulfed by flames. Tommy immediately called 911. First responders rushed to the scene, where they found that the truth of the incident was much darker and more twisted than they ever could have imagined. It wasn't just a man suffering from gunshot wounds, but a man who had also just watched his entire family be killed. This was no random break-in. Travis knew the assailant, and he made that clear to police. The Carter family was the poster of a wholesome suburban family with Christian values. Travis and his wife Paula had three children together. 16-year-old Linda was their eldest and their only daughter. The boys, Michael and Trevor, were 13 and 8, Travis was a pastor, and the Carters were very involved with their church. Linda sang in the church choir and often sang solos. It's been said that Linda's voice would sometimes move the church crowd to tears. Linda's rebellious phase manifested in the form of her 18-year-old boyfriend, Cody Williamson. As any parent would be, Linda's parents were slightly apprehensive of him at first. Travis recalls the first time Cody was invited over for dinner, where he was immediately left with a bad impression. Travis greeted him by saying, you must be Cody, to which he responded, and you are. Despite the rude response, this didn't initially sound too many alarms, and Cody continued to join the Carters for dinner, even attending church with them. Although this could seem like just a rude response or a rather benign example of defiance, it's actually a significant indication of Cody's antisocial traits. At 18 years old, and given the fact that he was meeting his girlfriend's parents for the first time, any typical teenager would have been more careful and respectful when responding to Travis's greeting. The fact that Cody said, and you are, indicates that he likely saw himself on an equal level to Linda's father. Plus, it's certainly not a friendly greeting that you would give to someone you're trying to impress. It's possible that Linda could have contributed to Cody's confidence and lack of respect. It's possible that Linda had been speaking poorly of her family to Cody. This could be another reason why Cody arrived with such an arrogant attitude. As time went on, Travis and Paula noticed a change in Linda's behavior. She was closed off to everyone except Cody. They would often seclude themselves from the rest of the churchgoers after service, and sometimes engage in public displays of affection that were seen as inappropriate for a Sunday service. The parents tried to put a stop to it by limiting the time the couple spent together, they set rules such as Cody hanging out at their house so that they would be there to supervise. He was to leave by 9 p.m. on school nights, and Linda could use her cell phone to talk to him until 10 p.m. This didn't slow their quickly intensifying relationship, however, and Cody bought Linda a promise ring. The fact that Linda was closed off to everyone except Cody can be considered pretty typical of her age. Adolescents can become obsessed with a boyfriend or girlfriend and act like there's no one else in the world besides that person. It's strange how no other behavioral descriptors are given about Linda from her parents that indicate antisocial personality disorder. Maybe Linda showed more concerning behaviors, but her parents may have minimized or dismissed them. When it became clear that the relationship would continue to cause problems, Paula put her foot down and said the two had to stop seeing each other. Their intentions were to keep their daughter safe, but they never could have imagined the danger that was on the horizon. The night that Travis crawled to his neighbor's house, he had seen things that were straight out of a horror movie. The Carters were sound asleep when Travis and Paula's bedroom door swung open with a bang. Several more loud bangs followed, this time gunshots. Bullets showered the room where they had been sleeping peacefully just seconds ago. Both Travis and Paula were shot multiple times. Travis recognized the assailant with the gun. It was Linda's boyfriend, Cody. He was accompanied by his friend, later identified as Calvin Wade. Along with guns, they were also carrying two large swords. Travis was lying in his bedroom, unable to move, when he heard his son Michael cry out, Why are you doing this, Cody? More gunshots followed. Wade had shot Michael in the face. The fact that swords were used adds to the horrific nature of these murders. It was almost like Cody and his friend Calvin Wade were enjoying the process, acting as if it were a scene from a movie, and they were the villains, or maybe they thought of themselves as the heroes. 
Cody and Wade could have committed these murders with guns alone. The swords were unnecessary to accomplish what they wanted, which reveals the profoundly evil intent here. It indicates that the two gained some sort of satisfaction from the process. Trevor, at only eight years old, hid in the corner of a closet. It is unfathomable, the fear that the little boy must have felt, hearing his family being brutally murdered all around him at the hands of his sister's boyfriend, knowing he would be next if they found him. Tragically, Cody and Wade found him in the closet. The pair both stabbed Trevor to death with the swords. Afterward, Cody went back to Linda's parents' bedroom and stabbed Paula in the neck with a sword to ensure that she died, nearly decapitating her. Once the two were sure they had killed everyone, they set the house on fire and drove away. They never expected that Travis would make it out of the burning house alive. Travis had been in and out of consciousness during the traumatic event. Still, he fought for his life to make it out of the house and to his neighbors. Everyone knew each other in Alba. It wasn't long after Travis named the killer that the police tracked Cody down. In fact, Chief Deputy Kyle Fletcher knew Cody well because he was a friend of Fletcher's son. On his way to the crime scene, Fletcher recognized Cody's car, where it was parked at Marcus Wade's single-wide trailer. Marcus was Calvin's older brother. His house had become a spot where Calvin and his friends could crash after a drunken night. When Fletcher arrived, Marcus let the police enter the home, but he couldn't recall if Cody had stayed the night there or not. Upon entry, the officers were faced with a mess of empty beer cans and dirty laundry. Wade and his girlfriend were woken up by the officers who were looking for Cody. While searching the home, Fletcher discovered a door frame that had been covered up with a blanket. He pulled back the blanket to discover Cody lying on a mattress with a gun next to him. Fletcher had to be cautious. Cody had just slaughtered an entire family. Who was to say that he wouldn't reach for the gun lying next to him and shoot? Fletcher asked Cody to show him his hands, then took the teen outside and told him what had happened to the Carter family the night before. Cody denied any involvement, claiming he got drunk that night and fell asleep. Because he was only wearing blue jeans, officers went inside to grab Cody a shirt and shoes. When they retrieved his clothes, they noticed blood splatters. As he was taken away in the back of a squad car, firefighters were still struggling to smother the fire that had consumed the Carter home. Despite their efforts, the entire house burned to the ground and the bodies were eventually recovered. As police searched the trailer, they discovered a purse with Linda's driver's license, shell casings, ammunition, and a used condom. As an officer began to sift through piles of clutter, he saw a tuft of blonde hair peeking out and grabbed it, assuming it was a doll. It wasn't. It was a teenage girl lying in a fetal position, facing away from the officer. He demanded that she stand up and put her hands where he could see them, but she didn't respond at all. He recognized her from the driver's license. It was Linda. Immediately, Linda began asking where she was and claimed she couldn't remember how she got there. She said she'd been drugged the night before and couldn't provide many details. Linda mentioned vague memories of a fire, two men in black with swords and drinking something. After the drink, everything became blurry. The police felt sorry for her and praised her strength in light of the traumatic event of losing most of her family. However, as the story unraveled at the station, the truth would come to light. Travis was certain he already knew Cody's motive, revenge because Paula had forbidden Linda from seeing him. Cody's version of the story, however, was not about rage. He claimed that he hadn't killed the Carter family for revenge. He did it because Linda asked him to. At the station, Cody was extremely forthcoming. Though he initially refused to name his accomplice, he eventually cracked. It was Calvin Wade. When Cody said, I'm very sorry for what I did, he sounded sincere. But his tone was matter-of-fact, as if, while he regretted it, the murders were inevitable. When asked about the mastermind behind it all, Cody refused to disclose the name, stating, A promise was made, and I can't break it. This is common with individuals displaying antisocial tendencies. They'll commit horrific acts but still adhere to twisted principles like keeping a promise. Cody seemed to speak with conviction, almost a sense of loyalty. It's also possible that Cody was trying to appear righteous or justify his actions to the investigator. Wade agreed to help with the murders because he'd been promised $2,000 by Linda and Cody. The money was kept in a lockbox in the Carter home. Wade, easily convinced, intended to use the money for court fees to gain custody of his daughter. Contrary to his plan, murdering four people and burning down a house proved not to be the best approach. During their interrogations, Cody and Wade were very forthcoming and even led police to the evidence they had left under a bridge and in the river. According to Cody and Wade, Linda, Wade and Cody were driven to the Carter home by Wade's girlfriend, Billy Jensen. 
Wade claimed Billy didn't know about their plan but insisted on tagging along. When they arrived at the Carter home, they were initially scared off by the family dog, which barked loudly and alerted everyone. Linda, determined, wasn't going to let this be the end of her plan. She called Cody repeatedly late into the night, urging him to come back and kill her parents. She promised to bring the dog inside so it wouldn't wake anyone up, but Cody and Wade were still hesitant. So, Linda snuck out with them. Billy drove them to a cemetery, where they sat for an hour, planning the murders of the Carter family. Cody claimed he attempted to reason with Linda multiple times, suggesting she just run away instead. She insisted that she wanted them permanently gone, not just her parents. She wanted her little brothers killed too, saying they were annoying and picked on her. The series of events described show the severity of Linda's and Cody's antisocial personality disorder because they extensively thought through their plan. This case was not a heat of the moment or anger-fueled murder. The murders were meticulously planned by two people who lacked empathy and likely had no conscience. Linda seemed undisturbed by the thought of making her family suffer, putting her parents and two brothers through such a horrific experience, an execution-style murder. It's likely that Linda either harboured deep, long-standing hatred for her family, or her psychopathy was so severe that she simply wanted them out of her way and had no issue with disposing of their lives. This is antisocial personality at its most severe, because even the worst psychopaths in history often target strangers. Those who plan and carry out brutal murders of their own family are the most dangerous types of sociopaths. The term menace to society fits individuals like Linda perfectly, as her willingness to destroy her own family shows how much worse her behavior could have been toward others. According to their plan, Calvin Wade was to kill Linda's brothers, while Cody carried out the murders of her parents. They burst into the house with a 22 caliber pistol and two samurai swords, nearly succeeding in their plan if Travis hadn't survived. What seemed to affect Cody most about that night was being ordered by Wade to make the kids come out of the locked room they were hiding in. Michael attempted to fight Cody off, but was immediately shot by Wade. Cody said he couldn't handle murdering Trevor, though he did stab him once. While Cody sounded remorseful during the interrogation, it's hard to gauge his true remorse. People with antisocial personality disorder often express regret only after they've been caught. Cody and Linda had plenty of time to show real remorse as they were planning these murders. But sociopaths focus only on achieving what they want. For them, the means to the end is just a transaction. In Cody and Linda's case, the murders were like a puzzle they needed to solve in order to succeed. A friend, Bradley, said he saw Cody before the murders and described him as happy-go-lucky. It's possible his mood was light because the murders were already planned and everything was set to take place. Bradley said the same about Calvin and Billy Jensen. This is disturbing, given that this group was about to enter a home, kill a family, and burn the house down. Linda and Cody were eager to carry out their plan, and Calvin and Billy may have been excited about the money they were promised. Wade recalled Linda being elated when they returned to the car with her packed suitcase. Once Linda confirmed her family was gone, she gave them the combination to the lockbox that contained the money. They also took all the money from Travis and Paula's wallets, which added up to about $400. They then set furniture and blankets on fire with pocket lighters, watching the house go up in flames as they drove away in Billy's car. Linda reportedly shouted, Holy shit, that was awesome, and expressed relief. During his interrogation, Wade said that Linda was as happy as a kid on Christmas. They drove to the river, where they tossed Linda's suitcase, the swords, and bloody boots into a box. Their plan was to come back for these items later. Finally, Billy dropped Linda and Cody off at Marcus Wade's trailer, where they celebrated their completed mission by sleeping together. When Billy was questioned, she initially claimed ignorance about the whole thing. She finally cracked when she learned that the police already had both boys in custody, confessing to everything. While Wade, Cody, and Billy all told stories that corroborated each other, Linda stuck to her claim that she didn't remember anything. However, her toxicology report showed no drugs in her system and no signs of smoke inhalation. Meanwhile, Travis was recovering at the hospital against all odds. He had fractured both cheekbones, broken his nose, and suffered nerve damage in his right arm. When detectives came to talk to him, he asked about his daughter's involvement in the deaths of their family. They responded with one devastating sentence. Her involvement was great. Travis immediately cried out in despair. It was inconceivable that his sweet little girl could have done something so evil. When told he could go home, Travis broke down again. He had no home to go to and no family left to return to. 
He stayed with his sister as he continued to live through the nightmare that had become his life. Linda was placed under arrest but denied her involvement through tears. Because she was a minor, she couldn't be immediately questioned. The small 16-year-old, who didn't fit the profile of a typical suspect, had been the mastermind behind this gruesome plot to have her family killed. Linda refused to speak with investigators, choosing to write a statement instead. She never wavered from her story. Linda was placed in a juvenile detention center, held on murder charges. Travis visited her there, but because every conversation was recorded and could be used against her in court, he couldn't ask her why she had done such a heinous thing. Despite knowing all the disturbing details, Travis continued to visit her. Linda was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences, plus 25 years for capital murder, on January 2, 2009. Cody and Wade were both given life without the possibility of parole for their crimes. Billy was sentenced to 40 years. To this day, Travis still visits Linda. In fact, he fights for her early release. Despite seeing the overwhelming evidence, he still can't bring himself to believe that his daughter could be capable of such a thing. Linda has told various stories about the events of the night her family was killed. In one version, she claimed that Cody wanted them dead, and her phone calls that night were her attempts to talk him out of it. Travis believes that Linda didn't truly think Cody would go through with the plan. Unbeknownst to him, Cody wasn't the first person Linda had tried to recruit for her plan. A previous boyfriend revealed that Linda had asked him to commit the same crime while they were dating. This ex-boyfriend refused to go as far as Cody did and thought Linda was crazy. He immediately told her to leave. This reveals more about Linda and her severe psychopathy. She was likely very manipulative, especially with her boyfriends. Linda may have used manipulation tactics, such as pressuring her past boyfriend to commit the crime to make her happy. She may have employed similar tactics with Cody, as in the interrogation, Cody seemed to suggest that his actions were inevitable, though he also appeared genuinely remorseful, almost as if he felt compelled to do it. This also indicates that Linda had been planning the murders for a long time, orchestrating the deaths of her parents and brothers while maintaining a facade of normalcy, living with them, going to church, and having dinners together. This underscores the severity of her antisocial personality, as she was able to harbor such horrific thoughts about her family while interacting with them daily. Her ability to maintain a facade of normalcy while desiring their deaths highlights her profound emotional detachment, lack of empathy, and absence of moral conscience.